What's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to the second episode of the CPA Zone, a podcast where we discuss tax strategies and accounting tips for small business owners and real estate investors. Today, we're going to talk a bit about self-directing your retirement accounts, specifically self-directed IRAs, and how this allows you to invest in things that you know, rather than being restricted to investments like stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So what exactly is a self-directed IRA? It's simply an IRA account for which you get to direct the investments. This allows you to tap into retirement funds and invest them in the products or assets that you know. Generally, most investment institutions like Fidelity or Vanguard, they're going to require you to invest in their products, which are stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. With a self-directed IRA, you get to decide what you invest in. It specifically, you will direct the account custodian or trustee how to invest the funds in your retirement account. Now, there are some rules you need to be aware of. To begin with, there are some prohibited investments. So your IRA, this doesn't just apply to self-directed IRAs. This applies to all IRAs. IRAs cannot invest in collectibles such as art or antiques, alcoholic beverages, certain metals and coins, stamps. Those collectible type things are a prohibited investment. Also prohibited are life insurance contracts. You cannot invest your IRA funds into life insurance. You also cannot invest in S-corporation stock. That's because IRAs are not legal shareholders for S-corporations. In addition, any investment that constitutes a prohibited transaction is prohibited. So generally, the restrictions for IRAs are more about with whom the IRA transacts than what assets they invest in. We just listed the prohibited investments. Now we're going to talk about prohibited transactions. There are three types of prohibited transactions. The first is what we call a per se prohibited transaction. This is when the IRA engages in a transaction with a disqualified person. Now disqualified person is the IRA owner and certain family members. So the IRA owner is disqualified. The spouse of an IRA owner is disqualified. Lineal descendants, kids and grandkids, ancestors of the IRA owner, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and any businesses that are owned and controlled by the IRA owner or family members. This is where the IRA owner or family members control 50% or more of a business. And that means the business itself is a disqualified person, cannot transact with the IRA. In addition, key persons in those business entities own 50% or more by a disqualified person are also disqualified. Those would be the officers and directors of these companies that an IRA owner or their family members may own 50% or more of the ownership. So those key officers, directors, key employees are also prohibited. I guess the IRS thinking here is that the people such as officers and directors of a company that you control are probably going to be more likely to do things that may benefit you or skirt the rules. So the IRS has just lumped them in with this list of disqualified persons. So those are per se prohibited transactions. The IRA engages in a transaction with a disqualified person. Now, transaction in this sense means in the typical business sense of the word, buying or selling, uh, providing of goods and services, lending, leasing, sales, all those business type transactions are what we're talking about. The IRA cannot enter into a transaction with a disqualified person. The second type of prohibited transaction is what's called an extension of credit transaction. So your IRA is allowed to use debt. However, you, the IRA owner, cannot guarantee the debt of an IRA and you cannot secure it with your personal assets. So let's say, for example, your IRA invests in a piece of rental real estate and takes out a loan to complete the transaction. Well, the loan the IRA, IRA takes must be secured by that rental property only. It should be a non-recourse loan. You cannot personally guarantee the loan for the IRA and you cannot secure that loan with any personal assets. So your primary residence can't secure the loan. So in short, IRA can secure the loan with the assets in which it invests, but it has to be a non-recourse loan with no personal guarantee by the owner and it cannot be secured by any personal assets of the owner. So that's the extension of credit transaction which is our second prohibited transaction. The third prohibited transaction is what's called self-dealing transactions. This occurs when the IRA owner or other disqualified persons benefit from the IRA investments 
on a per, at a personal level. So let's say, for example, your IRA owns a rental property. You can't stay there and use personal days at that property. So if you've got a short term rental on the beach that's really making you money hand over fist, things are going great. Uh, it happens to not be rented one weekend and you want to get away with the family. You figure, why not? We'll just go stay at the, our short term rental property. You can't do that. When the IRA owns it, there's no personal use by you or you violate the prohibited transaction known as self-dealing. Another type of self-dealing transaction is what we would call sweat equity. So you're doing work on the property that's owned by your IRA, handling the repairs yourself. And technically, the IRS views this as an indirect benefit by you saving money. It might seem a little silly, but that's how the rules are written. You've really got to draw a clear line between the IRA asset and what you do personally likely would not go out and work for free on someone else's rental property. So you should not do that with a rental property owned by your IRA. And the third example of a self-dealing transaction, which may occur, is when a disqualified person, like the account owner, is an officer or director or a highly compensated employee at a company in which the IRA invests. So we talked earlier about companies that the IRA owner controls with the 50% or more ownership. In this case, we're not dealing with a a company the IRA owner controls, but a company the IRA owner works at. It doesn't mean that the IRA can never invest in that company. However, we need to be careful because if it can be viewed that the IRA owner is somehow benefiting, maybe receiving additional compensation for their IRA investing in the company, then we run into this uh, self-dealing transaction which is another prohibited transaction and can get you in trouble. So what are the consequences of prohibited transactions? If the IRA owner enters into a prohibited transaction, the result is a distribution of the entire IRA account balance. So the distribution is taxable as regular income and subject to the 10% penalty if you're under the age of 59 and a half. Now, this is assuming we're dealing with a traditional IRA. If we're dealing with a Roth IRA, then your contributions that were put in will generally come back out tax-free and the tax will be limited to the earnings on that, uh, on the investments in that IRA account. And then again, the 10% penalty, if you're under 59 and a half, will also be assessed on those earnings. So not as bad with a Roth, but it's, it's still pretty bad. Could be steep penalties and you lose all that future tax-free growth that would otherwise take place in your Roth. So you need to be very careful when you're self-directing And make sure you're following all the rules. Work with someone that's qualified to advise you. Make sure you've got a good self-directed trust company in place that's going to help coach you along. You don't want to run into a case where you cause your IRA to be distributed. So now we're going to talk briefly about the two types of tax you may run into dealing with a self-directed IRA. The first is what's called unrelated business income tax or UBIT. UBIT applies or may apply to an IRA when that IRA receives ordinary income as opposed to income from investments. So by law, interest, dividends, capital gains, royalty income, and rental income are exempt from UBIT when that income is generated with an IRA. Ordinary income is subject to unrelated business income tax. So if your IRA is doing fix and flips or invested in a small business like a hair salon generating ordinary income, then that income is going to be subject to UBIT, which is taxed at the trust tax rate. So trust tax rates are similar to the individual rates, but on a very compressed uh, marginal tax rate bracket. So the top marginal tax rate of 37% with a trust starts at about 14500 in 2023. So you hit that top marginal rate very quickly. The second type of tax you might run into is what's called unrelated debt finance income tax. So it's UDFI. So UDFI taxed at the same rates as UBIT with that top marginal rate starting at 14500 The UDFI applies when an IRA uses leverage with its investments. So let's uh, consider an example where your IRA invests in a rental property. It puts down $50,000 cash on a $100,000 property and it finances the other $50,000. And let's say this rental property turns $10,000 a year in income. Well, the way UDFI works is it looks at how much of that asset is financed 
and uses that ratio, and then the tax will apply to that portion of the income. So in our example, the IRA put $50,000 cash down on a $100,000 rental and financed the other $50,000. So the total assets financed 50%. The UDFI will apply to 50% of the income. This property is generating $10,000 a year in income. So 50% of that $5,000 is going to be subject to UDFI. So you need to be aware when these types of taxes can pop up. There are some strategies to get around them. So for example, with UBIT, unrelated business income tax, you can use what's called a C blocker. This is when there, you set up a C corporation that's going to run the business and the IRA owns the C corporation. So the C corporation is going to pay the standard corporate income tax on the profits, but then any dividends paid out to the IRA are going to come out. And obviously dividends are not taxed in an IRA because they're excluded from UBIT. With UDFI, you can't avoid it necessarily in the IRA itself. However, if you were to use a different retirement vehicle, like a solo 401k, then UBIT doesn't apply on debt that's used to finance the purchase of real property. So if you're looking to invest in rental real estate using retirement funds, and you have a business in place that you can establish a solo 401k in, then it probably makes sense if you can to use that solo 401k to invest in the rental property, and you can avoid the UDFI. Now, in cases where you do have to pay UBIT or UDFI, you'd file a Form 990-T. That's the tax return used to report these two types of taxes. And you know, at the end of the day, if the numbers make sense, paying the UBIT or UDFI is not the end of the world, but you need to be aware of when it may pop up so you can run a proper analysis. If you're looking at buying a rental property in your IRA, these are two key numbers that need to be factored in if they're going to apply to you. That way you have a good set of numbers to help you base your decision on. So to summarize, self-directed IRAs are wonderful. They allow you to access retirement funds to invest in alternative assets such as real estate rather than, be, rather than being constricted to the typical stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. However, if you're going to go this route, you need to be aware of the rules that you need to deal with when it comes to self-directed. You have prohibited investments. We talked about collectibles life insurance, S-corporation, stock, and then the prohibited transactions. There's three types per se when you transact with a disqualified person, extension of credit, and the self-dealing, where self-dealing is where the account owner receives some sort of personal benefit from dealing with the IRA, which is a no-no. And then last but not least, we just talked about the UD, UDFI and UBIT or UBIT taxes may apply in some cases, and it's best to be aware and know how to factor those into your calculations. So that about does it with today's episode of the CPA Zone. Thank you for listening. And as always, we are taking on new clients. If you'd like to work with us, you can find us on our website at thepulisgroup.com forward slash contact. That's T-H-E-P-U-L-I-C-E dot com forward slash contact. Thank you and have a great day.